Amen. <clears throat> we are returning this morning to the first chapter of Thessalonians. <clears throat> and uh, in particular, uh, we're going to look at verses 6 and through to verse 8. <clears throat> now, we know that we are working our way through what is, in reality, an introductory concept, one that Paul will be uh, confirming and uh, addressing as he goes right through this entire epistle. We have noted just briefly that he is uh, compelling those to whom he writes to be concerned about the need to exercise true Christian conduct, that is, to practice what we preach as Christians so that we're not just full of words, but that we have a life that uh, is uh, exemplified uh, to those around us as producing the fruit uh, of holiness and of righteousness. And as uh, we do that, we have to keep this central theme or thought in mind. <clears throat> and we have noted that at the end of every chapter in the first epistle, the Apostle Paul concludes with uh, these uh, statements relating to the return of the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul in his day was mindful that Jesus would come quickly. And if Paul was in agreement with that concern, how much more ought we to be employed with that concern in our mind and heart today? We look around the world and we don't really need to be told by too many that the return of Jesus is drawing near. It is therefore imperative that we take the time to examine these concerns of Paul and to address them in our own heart and life. Now, as we, <clears throat> we do, we come back into this sixth verse where Paul uses this word, you became followers of us. Uh, this is a, an interesting word. We have already uh, taken note of, of what the word means. It, it has in its uh, context and connotation that thought of uh, discipleship, uh, following uh, Jesus. And here uh, Paul is using that in the context of this teaching. You became followers of us and of the Lord. Paul is not prioritizing the walk. <clears throat> he is simply stating a fact. Paul follows Jesus, and those to whom he now writes are following his example, but ultimately they are following the example of Jesus. And that is how it ought to be. We do not build a fan club around ourselves, but we become signposts that others read and learn, and then in turn we point them to Jesus. That is the ultimate concern of living a godly life. The word that is used here uh, for followers, translated followers in verse 6, uh, literally means imitators. Imitators. And we've asked the question before, if others are looking at us, what kind of example are we giving to them? That ought to be a motivation for us to live a life pleasing uh, unto God. Now, we, uh, we have uh, noted that Paul's concern is that we get things right. 
not just in church on Sunday, not just uh, through midweek at Bible study or prayer meetings or whatever, but that we are in that position where everything that we do uh, has that stamp of approval of heaven upon it. So that if anyone at any time were to stumble upon us, we would not be ashamed of what we are doing, where we are going, or how we are living. We need to live under that constraint that at all times the eye of the Lord is upon us. Now, the question that we are addressing uh, here uh, is uh, that of the believers in Thessalonica who came into faith at a very difficult period of time. And uh, we have noted in the book of Acts how that both in, in Philippi and Thessalonica there was opposition to the word. So the question is, do our words become vain when we are put under strain? That's the concern and the burden of these opening comments of uh, the apostle. Now, what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to take you back into the study notes for last week. You probably know that we didn't really get into the study uh, deeply last Sunday. So rather than miss out on that, I'm going to take you back there and we're going to progress forward as we build precept upon precept and uh, statue upon statue until we have a firm foundation. And uh, that's important for us uh, to do. Uh, And in order to do that, we're going back into the example of the Apostle Paul. Last week, we looked at Paul's commitment. And uh, today, we're going to look at, uh, at Paul's confidence as he commits his uh, whole life and future to, uh, to the Lord. To do this, we want to begin by going into the Old Testament, back into Exodus chapter 24. Now, we've touched on this in our evening service as we study the book of Hebrews, but I feel that it's appropriate and pertinent that we uh, pull this into our thoughts and uh, use these thoughts as a <clears throat> as a kind of launching pad or springboard into what we want to conclude our thoughts with this morning. The book of Exodus, chapter twenty four <clears throat> and verse three. Now the challenge of uh, the chapter is uh, set out in verse 1. God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, that's the two sons of Aaron. Therefore, what we are seeing in verse 1 is the delegated and appointed priesthood. And uh, they are called, along with 70 of the elders of Israel, And uh, they are summoned to the top of the mountain in order that they worship God. Now, in context with what we are looking at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're looking here at example. God is setting an example. And uh, what we will discover is that with God, example will become pattern. See, we will establish a pattern when we follow the example. So that's what this chapter is all about. Verse 1, we have the example. Moses, Aaron, his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, 
and seventy of the elders of Israel are to worship from afar. Now we read, And Moses alone shall come near the Lord. So here is the second thought, and the second key to understanding this chapter. From worship comes direction. Moses begins in worship with Aaron, his two sons, and the seventy elders. And from that worship, Moses is now called to come alone into a more intimate place with God. You cannot be called into intimacy with God apart from the place of worship. And here, uh, the, the pattern now is beginning to emerge. So Moses, verse 3, came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. So from the worship, come the disciplines, and now Moses must reveal those disciplines to the children of Israel. So as they are assembled and gathered in verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Now note, this is a response of the will. This is a response of the will. But there's something missing at this point. Let me just throw this little thought into your mind, and then we'll proceed to build on this. A young couple standing at the altar, they are about to be joined in holy wedlock. The pastor says to them, will you take this woman to be your wife? Will you take this man to be your husband? And what is the response? I will. That is a response of the will. But can we end the ceremony at that point and go away satisfied? No, we cannot. Because the response of the will may not necessarily be the response of the heart. And there is a difference. Now, we come back into this uh, chapter. I don't want you wandering off now and, and delving into your memory and thinking back to your wedding day and all of that. Leave that until you go home this afternoon. Let's go back into this, uh, this chapter. So they have said with one accord, they're all agreed, whatever God has said, we will do. Now we'll skip down to verse 7. And here Moses has now moved this deeper into the observation of God's will and purpose. And you will see in verse 5 that now we're talking about burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings. And verse 6, we're talking about shed blood and altars and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And then in verse 7, here now we have, Then he took the book of the covenant. So you will note that the book of the covenant does not appear at this point until 
after the sacrifice. So we have the giving of the law. We have the words of the Lord delivered and confirmed. Then we have the application of these requirements in the sacrifice. And now we have the book of the law. You see, the promise that God makes to us will always be the result of the shedding of blood. It will always be on the grounds of obedience. Jesus became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So, now we read, And they said, verse 7, when the book of the covenant was read in the hearing of the people, they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. That's the matter of the will. But now notice, they add, and be obedient. That is the matter of the heart. Now, I could get myself into all kinds of hot water this morning by taking you back to the old traditional wedding vows where the bride was uh, called upon and expected to respond to that uh, question about obedience. Love, honor, and obey. And the wife would be expected to say, I do. But we don't say that anymore. It's not uh, common in wedding ceremonies. For what wife wants to confess and uh, to promise that she's going to obey her husband when he's not capable of making good sound judgments and good decisions? uh, Why would you commit to doing that? But without getting into all of that, Here is the the thought. They have now stepped on the basis of the shed blood, on the basis of the covenant God has established with them. They have now gone beyond the will and they have now surrendered their heart. All that God has said, we will do and we will be obedient. Look back at your conversion. Look back at that moment when you gave your heart and life to Jesus. Was there not involved there a total giving, a total commitment? How is it today? Are you still fully committed to the covenant of promise, of grace, of mercy, of love? But here, we now have this response of the heart. They said they would do it and they meant it. But I'm just going to put in brackets there. At that time. You see, our surrender to God is only as strong as the last time. And here the children of Israel are about to be put to the test. Into chapter 25. Let's remember the basis of this relationship. The Lord said to Moses, spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Now note this next thought. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. Now, this is not the will. This is the heart. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. And here we read, you shall take my offering. So, this is the basis of the relationship. It is a willing obedience. Obedience. But come down now, still in chapter 25, and uh, look at verse 8. 
Uh, here is the pattern that we have been speaking of. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. You see, it's all right to say when God comes in a special and unique formula, reveals himself to me in an incident or in a moment, it's all right for me at that point to say yes, and to be obedient, and to will to do what God wants me to do. But what about every day, every moment, every experience? See, God is now saying, well, I was with you on the mountain. I was with you when Moses opened the book of the covenant and made blood sacrifice. I was with you when you said that you would obey my words and follow my instructions. But here is the good news, or is it the bad news? I've decided I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. In fact, I'm going to come down and dwell among you. That means 24-7. God is there. Now can I ask you, how good do you feel about this? Whatever we are, however we react or respond or act in amongst those around us, God is there. He hears. He knows. Our dealings with one another. Are we always honest above board? Is our word our bond? How do we live out the instructions God has given us remembering that he is among us. So here now is a pattern. It's not just an example anymore. It's now becoming a pattern. We're going to have to live like this, whether we like it or not, every day because God has come among us to dwell with us. And if we as believers do not establish a pattern, if we're simply jumping from example to example, we cannot lay claim to being fully committed in our mind, our will, and also in our heart to the things of God. God will not accept another rival to the loyalty of our love for him. So how then does this all work out? Well, let's jump over to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. And uh, in particular, we'll go to verse 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. See, back in chapter 24 and 25, God spoke to Moses. Moses spoke to the people. But now, God writes it down. You see, the pastor doesn't have to be with you 24-7 to keep you on the right track. God has given you his word. It's written. It's established. It's confirmed. 
And we should be living and leading our lives on the basis of the written word of God. That's why our official title is Sovereign Grace Bible Church. That is our aim, our desire, to build upon the word of God. So how did things work out? God has given them his word. They have pledged their loyalty to it. So how does it all work out now? Let's go into chapter 32. Let's uh, look at verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Moses, dare he even think about spending so much time up the mountain with God? When we are here needing to be led and needing to be fed, is he not interested in us? And this restless congregation very soon begin to complain and to murmur. It's in the system. It's in their makeup anyway. They have often complained to Moses and about Moses. And they're just not going to be satisfied, but here is the saddest thing of all. They find a priest who encourages their waywardness and their wantonness and their rebellion against God. Now, Aaron should have known better. Right back at the beginning of this thought, there he was, going up the mountain with Moses. He was there at the opening of the book of the covenant. He was involved in all of this. He knew in his mind and heart what God had said. But when the people come wanting to agitate for some kind of token that they were important and significant and that God would give them the authority to make their own way to holiness. They found Aaron prepared to identify with them. See, this is the sad thing. You could leave this church today and you would find a dozen churches all around this city that would accommodate your ideas, your concepts, your concerns. You wouldn't find it difficult to get another church that may not be as severe on you, may not be as disciplined as we are here, may not be as insistent that we stay with the Scriptures and we don't go to the left hand or to the right hand. There are many who wear the garb of priests, who have not heard the call of God and are not standing in the gap and uh, warning the congregation of their need to be faithful and loyal to God. Aaron failed miserably. What a disappointment. What a disgrace. I remember when I was a young, a young uh, man in my Late teens in Bible college, we had um, regular visits from uh, uh, an older gentleman who used to be the the uh, principal of the college that uh, I attended. Uh, God had used him mightily up in the islands of Scotland in revival. He saw multitudes coming to know Christ in the most remarkable ways. And he would come in and he would preach to the students. He would teach us from God's Word. And I can 
still see him standing there before the class. And uh, he had one statement that we heard. I think we heard it every sermon that he preached. Uh, And it was simply this, that uh, there are many who give in to the lure of a lesser loyalty. That's what happened to the children of Israel. They give in to the lure of a lesser loyalty. Their heart and mind was distracted. What about the whatever he says we will do and be obedient? That has gone. And now they go in search of another God. And look down at verse 22 of Exodus chapter 32. And here we read, And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. Set on evil. Now here is the confusion in Aaron's mind the hotness or the fierceness of God's wrath up against the total wantonness, evil in the heart of the children of Israel. And Aaron is saying virtually to God, let them off with it. Don't punish them, even though they ought to know better. Well, time doesn't allow us this morning to work through to the end of this scenario, of this saga. But the sad reality is that they had every opportunity. They had the example set out for them. That example became a pattern. And even with the presence of God among them, they lose that intimacy with God. Now we're coming over into our thoughts on Thessalonians chapter 1. We still have a little bit of time. So let's just take a little quick look at um, one or two other concerns this morning. We're going to look at Paul's contentment. Let's go to chapter 4 of Philippians. Into Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, verses 9 through to 12. And we won't delay our thoughts here. We won't linger for too long because uh, eventually we're going to get round to this in our Wednesday night studies. And it's something to look forward to. But uh, let's just look from verse 9. In verse 8, I'm not going to read it, but just look at verse 8, and you will see that Paul has gone from example to pattern. From example to pattern. And that's set out in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are, and he gives us the pattern that we need to follow. Now, then he writes, the things which you learned. Now, underscore that word. The things that you learned and received. Now, let me just bring that back into the context of what we have been considering. The will and the heart. Look at that again. You learned and received and heard and saw in me. These do, and the God of peace will be with you. So we're back now to the example that Paul is setting. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished 
again. Now that's interesting. I'm not going to give you the answer to the question that no doubt is on your mind just now. Was there a time that these Philippian believers didn't take care of Paul? Weren't all that concerned about his needs? Or is Paul just feeling a little bit out of sorts, sorry for himself, and having a little grumble? What's really going on here? Well, you'll have to come to a Wednesday night Bible study to get the answers to all of that. Your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care. I'm sure you did care. You didn't show it much, but I'm sure you did care. But you lacked opportunity. Now, verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need. You see, here is the reality. If you don't look after me and I don't look after you, don't worry. God's looking after both of us. And that's the main thrust and the main concern. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And then if you look through verse 12 onwards, you will see that he develops a little bit more understanding of what he means. And then he concludes, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So here we have in verse 11, uh, I have learned. Note that's a process. That's not an experience. It's a whole lot of experiences all brought in together. It's learning from this thing and from that thing and from the other thing until through the process I have learned to be content. So that even if this is not like that. I know that whatever the next one will be, God will be with me. That's the confidence that the apostle has, and that is the contentment. But now notice in verse 12, we go from the I have learned of verse 11 to the I know in verse 12. So verse 11 has the process that we go through. Verse 12 has the power that enables us to go through the process. So Paul is saying, I have learned how to be content. And now I know that whatever circumstance I am in, that God is with me and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, where is all of this taking us to? Well, I'm going to go back into last study, last Sunday, and just quote a text that you all ought to know off by heart. If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is the example that Paul is reminding us of. And as we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Christ, we learn how to be content. Because we prove that the power of God is not only with us, but is in us. 
And therefore we can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, Paul was an example because he had learned how to follow Christ. What are we told by Peter in 2 Peter 3, verse 18? You'll all be familiar with this. We've just uh, considered this in our Wednesday night uh, studies in the book of uh, Peter. Peter tells us that we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We are to grow in grace and in knowledge. Now, how did Paul learn? Let's uh, go over into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we might have to uh, consider winding up our thoughts around this, uh, this text. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I was to ask you, what is the most familiar chapter in uh, the Bible? The most well-known. You would probably say, well, I think possibly the best known is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. You go to a funeral and we hear it. You go to a wedding and we could well hear it. It's a lovely psalm. But in the New Testament, I would suppose that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is one of those uh, chapters that we've all read many, many, many times. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Now remember that every time Paul writes, he projects himself in his material. He will not preach, nor will he teach anything that he has not proved to be true. He writes with determination, but he writes with deep conviction. And as he has described himself as not coming among the people to represent persuasive words of man's wisdom, he does not see himself as a great orator, but he sees himself as a weak vessel filled with the power and the energy of the Spirit of God. And so as he writes, he is presenting not only his knowledge, but also his heart. Without love, Paul is teaching us, we are nothing. Now, we come uh, with, uh, with Paul to, uh, to try to understand the reasoning uh, in the mind of Paul as he writes these, uh, these thoughts. We come down into verse 11. This is the verse I want to leave with you. When I was a child... I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But we pause there, just briefly. We have just read verse 1. One of the great challenges of this entire book to the Corinthians Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Paul, did you know that when you were a child? Did you really understand what you've just written when you were a child? Let's read a little more. But when I became a man, you see, verse 1 is not a verse for children. It's a verse for men. And that's sadly where many fall into 
trouble because they don't fully appreciate the context in which these teachings are given. We can get caught up in the trivial things that uh, Paul discusses with the Corinthian church and end up with totally wrong interpretations. Let's hear a little more from Paul. When I became a man, I put away childish things. So, now when we read the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we don't read it from the viewpoint of a child. We read it from the viewpoint of a man. And when we do, we begin to see the proper interpretation of the chapter. But here is the point. Very sadly, there are many Christians who just never grow up. They remain, as it were, children. They don't know anything about deny himself or herself and take up the cross and follow me. In fact, if they don't get their own way, it won't be the cross they'll pick up. It'll be their bat and ball. And they'll head home in the huff, disrupted in their plans, and processes. I want you to just look before we conclude at Matthew chapter 11, and then we'll come back to this, God willing, next Lord's Day. And there'll be no more man next door uh, to curtail the, the sermon. Let's, uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 11. And again, the, the context of all of these are vital to our understanding of Scripture. Matthew chapter 11. And uh, we want to, to just look at verse 16. Now, if, if you have a Bible that has the words of Jesus in red, you will see that all through these pages we have the, lead, the, the red type, uh, which indicates that, that this, this is um, a, a very serious portion of Scripture. Uh, Jesus is speaking directly to us, and we have to listen. And we would do well to go back in uh, to the, the full context of this, but we would literally have to read most of Matthew in order to do that. But I just want you to get the point that this is not the beginning nor is it the end of this sermon. This is right in the heart of it. So Jesus, he's not building up and he's not winding up. He is right in the heart of of what he wants to say to the people. And here is this little thought. Verse 15, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, you're not all going to understand this. You're, you're not all going to get the message that I'm bringing even though you've all been sitting here and you're listening to what I'm saying, I know that not all of you are going to understand this. So here it is for those who do understand. Let's now look at verse 16. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we have played the flute for you and you did not dance. We 
mourned to you and you did not lament. Come and play my little game and no one comes. I'll change the game. So instead of uh, playing at weddings, dancing, singing, celebrating, let, let's try playing at funerals instead. But it doesn't seem to matter what we want to do. Nobody's going to play along with me. So we get more and more selfish, more and more arrogant, more and more determined that somehow we will get the attention that we deserve. Jesus said, just take a look around. What do you see? Grown men having sensible discussions, making reasonable assertions, and then drawing satisfying conclusions. No, we see men running around like children playing in the marketplace. Well, could we not apply this in so many ways today as we look out across the world? Paul had grown up Paul knew the direction that God wanted him to take. But as Paul looked around, he observed that there were many so-called Christians who were not satisfied with the teaching of God's Word. They didn't want the discipline of living under the entitlements of Scripture. They wanted the shortcut they wanted to do their own thing. And if, if the pastor can't give it to us, then we'll invent it ourselves. And as you read through Scripture, you will find over and over and over and over again the waywardness of the people. Paul said, I have learned. I was a child. I did things wrong. I made mistakes. Look at how I even persecuted the church. And I was a man, but I was behaving like a child. But I've grown up, I've learned, I've developed, I've matured. And now, for me to live is Christ. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ who lives in me. And I'm following the example of Jesus and now I'm writing to you in the church at Thessalonica to congratulate you and to confirm that you have developed a maturity. You have grown up. You are no longer children because you are also following my example as I follow the example of Jesus. What about those who hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that could hold no water. See, that's the kind of thing a child does. And we need to grow up as the people of God so that we can be a real witness, a real testimony, a real example to those around us. Let me ask you again. If you were to be the only Bible that your neighbors would read, if you were the only Christian ever to live in your street, are you setting the right example for those around you to learn about Jesus and to long to know him as their Savior? Have you surrendered your will? Have you surrendered your heart? Have you taken up your cross to follow him? Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word.
and pray that you will bless it and bless us in the hearing of it to the praise of the glory of your grace through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.